welcome back to the Metal Voice. Thank you, thank you, uh, David DeFay <laughs> from, of course, Virgin Steel. Um, it's very exciting news because uh, Guardians of the Flame and actually Virgin Steel Part One or Virgin Steel One debut <laughs> album One is being re-released, but this time as a remix on yeah. August twenty third on Steam Hammer SPV. So that's great news, Dave. Thanks, man. Thank you. I remember the last time we talked to you about a year ago, you were saying on the first album, that is, you're not quite sure about if you had the masters in good condition to be remixed. Was it AI that helped you sort of rebuild what was lost? Well, no, no, no. It's really just the old school taking the actual physical tapes, putting them in the uh, convection oven, baking them, taking them out and uh, making brownies with them. No, well, transferring <laughs> And, uh, uh, and going going from there, yeah, that was a. Uh, it worked pretty well. They uh, actually held up pr uh, pretty darn well. More so the uh, second album than the first album. But but yeah, the, even the first album is all pretty much there. A few things along the way that yeah, you got to deal with. Something's kind of missing. How do I deal with that? Whatever. Uh, but I made it all work. That's pretty amazing. I thought you know, like I know that Blue Oyster Cult. They used AI to separate oh yeah to to separate all the instruments and, and i guess in some cases it can be done in other cases probably can't be done and then sort of remix what's there so i'm not sure you know if you did that or not but apparently you didn't you did it the old school way yeah there were a couple of things that the actual multi-tracks were a little problematic so i did a little bit of that on one or two songs and it's not not the best way to go about it um i know it, it i guess it all hinges on the mix what how dense the mix is and so it understands what's going on so it's very little of that went on most of it was right. just i had the original multi-track and away we went let's go back in time and as we go back in time we can revisit what has changed and what hasn't changed on the the first and the second album sure. okay we, we've already gone through you know how you how you got together as a band but you're at the starting point you're you and jack and the rest of the band you're you're writing the material that was to be the demo that turned into the album right so let's yeah. start off at that point you're writing these songs <laughs> i mean would you have you had would you have a clue that these songs would be you know remixed and reissued and re remastered all these years later not not really no no uh we were just uh, together about three weeks, putting together this stuff. Jack had a lot of ideas. I had ideas. We put them together, and uh, uh, we went into the studio and just basically played live. And that was it. It was supposed to be demos, but we started making cassette copies of of the album, sending it out, and people liked it. So, you know, we had the bright idea. Well, why don't we press this thing and uh, press it? We did. I pressed up 5,000, sold 5,000, basically from the trunk of my car, driving <laughs> around to record stores and uh, different distributors and mailing others away. And uh, within a very short period of time, they sold out. So we said, all right, let's do another 5,000. And then once those were uh, pressed up and starting to go, uh, before they were finished with that batch, we had a deal with Music for Nations in England and Mongol Horden States. So we all went very very quickly what was the scene like back then in 82 if you just go back in time you know i, I believe manowar were starting off did you did you have a connection and you guys are in the same area more or less you know in the new york area i guess right well they're upstate new york we're more closer to the city we're on long island but uh we didn't really know them then we didn't really meet them until about uh 83 yeah so like when guardians came out we, we did our first shows with them so it was fairly, fairly often, fairly, fairly early, but uh, not during the first album time. Yeah, second album that we first album had. time. Are you playing Lemours? Are you playing? This yeah, album? yeah, we played Lemours with Anthrax, and uh, I'm because they were up and coming. Um, we played like, the shows with the, with with Man of War. We did shows on our own. We did a lot of uh, uh, shows at a place called Cheers, the Rock Nightclub, which was like just basically down the street from where I lived. And they used to have mostly cover bands in there. That was the scene back then. Mm -hmm. But they also had bands like Zebra who were doing a mix of new music, their own music, 
and uh, uh, Zeppelin and whatnot, and Twisted. Twisted was uh, around doing a lot of stuff, and they started doing more and more of their own music and less and less of the uh, cover thing. So, uh, yeah, we were, you know, coming in on that scene and into that whole um, that whole world. Yeah, I was going out to see all those bands, you know, before Broken Steel formed and um then we just jumped in and was, were uh, sharing stages with people like that and so on and so forth in 82 would you say that there was more traction happening globally or more traction happening locally for virgin steel uh prior to putting out the first record it was it was it was, it was a bit more on the local situation but those sets were finding their way in europe and then that's that's why that happened. I mentioned uh, Twisted Sister. They were working with people um, who we worked with afterwards. Uh, I think there was a label called Food for Thought. It was two guys, Steve Mason and Martin Hooker. They just they were working with the Twisted people, and we knew about that. And then those two guys formed a new label called Music for Nations, and we were in fact MFN One, Music for Nations One, the very first release on this new label. And after that. They signed up everybody, Rat, Merciful Fate, um, Wasp, Metallica, and the list goes on. Everything metal was like on that label. When you were signed to that label, was it a fair was it a fair contract? I guess since you have your masters today, you must have acquired them back or you already had them from the start. Uh, we sent them over there um and then they sent them back it was so it was never that we never let anybody keep anything i've got all the masters for all the records yeah yeah, yeah. i mean because you know you're hearing stories today like after 30 years that 30 year rule, rule where you can get everything back of your ownership of what you had or you didn't have and uh i guess that's not your case you were smart enough to uh, make the right deal at the right time i was always very very protective of things of that nature and was a bit of a tyrant around that sort of thing. So was very careful about where things would go and where they wouldn't go. Okay, good, good. Okay, let's get into the music, right? Okay, so you're taking what was a demo, which became an album, which so many, so many decades later, people still remember. Why has this album stood the test of time, in your opinion? The first I, guess this, I guess there's a certain amount of uh, energy and exuberance that's on there combined with with good songs that, that that work you know that's that's all i can attribute to really we were very very possessed when we went into that studio and uh, the whole record was, was done in less than a week recorded and mixed and it's all like i said live in the studio so uh, yeah there were mistakes and things along the way but uh they kind of go by the wayside because the energy level is so you know on on 11 kind of thing what did you like i you know what i was trying to do i was trying to play the the remastered versus the remix it's hard because you're you're putting them <laughs> back and forth and i'm playing one did i hear it there i did i hear it there and and it's cleaner it's a lot cleaner and there's i find if if i was to sort of use shapes i would say the remaster sounds like a circle where everything's sort of pressed together and the remix it's more open spaced and widened if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely clearer, cleaner. I, my goal was to preserve the fire, the feeling, the ambiance of those records, but make it sonically more understandable to the ear. What are the little things that you added that weren't there before on that first one? Uh, there are some little keyboard flourishes, things like that, some some things in the, they're not like very, uh, high in the mix but they're in there things things of that nature occasionally some uh synthy guitar type things that are in there um orchestral percussion things i added along the way because i would have done that had we made the record today you know knowing what i know so it's like well this could benefit from that but in a way that's subtle not so over the top with it still in love with you i think that's what you're talking about there's a, a bit of an orchestration somewhere in the background maybe i'm wrong about that oh which which one still, still in love with you yeah. i think right in about like sort of like just lingering in the back there's a little bit of an orchestration happening it's keyboards i guess right yes there's a lot of there's a lot of actually that one probably has the most of, of what i did for that album that one and, and also uh children of the storm yeah and the, Children of the Storm, I found it's still heavy, but it was the guitars are a little more lower in the mix. 
but somehow I don't know. You captured the whole song itself was heavier, but yeah, yeah. The drums are are, are more weighty in that. So like a Zeppelin kind of mix, like the early Zeppelin stuff, but the drums were like where all the power came from. You can still hear Jack, of course, everywhere. And what's what's important to be heard is, is all there. But yeah, I tried to balance it a bit more. Whereas the the original mix was very edgy, very trebly, you know, kind of like you wouldn't want to listen to the record um, more than once in one sitting kind of a thing. It, your ear gets like fatigued after a while. I tried to make it so like, yeah, you could put the record on all day and, and you can enjoy it. How long did it take you to put this all together, the first album, like the remix? Uh, I, well, I did both uh, kind of like one after the other. So it's hard to say. I actually started with Guardians and then, then I saw that that was going well. I said, well, let, maybe I, because I thought originally, maybe I'll just remaster the first record. But then I was like, wait a minute, this is going well. Let me at least give it the old college try on the first record. And I said, all right, yeah, this is fun. This is working. This is going to happen. Let's, 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 let's carry on. I guess it was several months for both of them. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. What, what's it like? So now you're, you know, you're listening to your vocal takes and you're listening to the guitars and the drums and you're going, it really brings you back, doesn't it? It's like, oh, oh sure. I remember, sure. I remember I how that. did I hit that note? Like, it's like. <laughs> oh, it's, it's crazy. I'm thinking about like all kinds of things. I had times out with Joey Basing, the drummer, Joel, you know, Jack, you know, uh, going to clubs together and, and gigs we did and so on and so forth. Yeah, it all came back. And I actually spoke to Joey actually while I was in the middle of doing this, I hadn't spoken to him in ages and uh, we've made plans to actually see each other yeah so you know so that's good so you bring back the memories um yeah. what about um the other tracks the demos i think there's a lot of stuff that were demos from before right or there was there anything new that you put on that you haven't sort of re-released i know there's been a lot of releases over the years yeah on 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 Virgin still one uh there are all these four track demos that burn still one is, was made uh, with an eight track studio but we had done right after we did that record, um, we went into a small four track studio and demoed some things that ended up being on Guardians, like Life of Crime and uh, Burn Sun, and then a new song called The Lesson. So those were four track demos. Uh, that lesson never appeared anywhere. I just put that on there and said, okay, let's, let's use those because that's from that era. Uh, and then what else is on there? Oh yeah, Hell from Beyond the Stars. That's that's a new track that's written in the spirit of and recorded in the spirit of something that would be on like Exorcist or one of those thrash records that we made in the eighties. That's that kind of vibe. I've actually done a video for that, so that'll come out at some point. I've done okay. five videos already for the two records, and there's oh, three. Really? Wow. I'm win yeah, yeah. Uh, we did an alternate version of the song The Fire God, which uh, was uh, appeared on House of Atreus One Act One. And then there's a new, brand new version of the song Virgin Steel that was just done for this because I wanted to do something uh, featuring the lineup now and what's going on now in the group. And uh, I thought, well, what would I do? Well, I said, that's a good song to do because it's got like all the various elements that, that you know, were uh, further developed later, that whole gothic, barbaric, symphonic thing. And uh, we've done a video for that one as well. So, yeah, so that's, what's, that's, that's the first album in a nutshell. So basically, just to summarize, Virgin Steel, it's a re-recording, right? Yeah. The brand present new. band today. The Fire God is an alternate take that you had from uh, previous albums, right? Not really. It was actually, uh, it was took some of the basic elements that were from the last record, the Atrius record, and then we recorded some stuff with that. Okay. And then the demos are just the demos, the four-track demos you had from prior, from before. Yeah, right? they're remixed, they're re refurbished. Uh, resurrected, and then the um, Hell from Beyond the Stars is something that was put together, like I said, in the spirit of those that threshing doom stuff like Exorcist. All right, so back in the day in '82, this album comes out. Uh, you're, 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 you know, you've gone from selling it out of your car, the back of your car, to to some sort of hype that's going on. You know, a buzz that's happening with Virgin. I remember back then, you know, when Virgin Steel sort of like was starting off. I thought you guys from your, were Europe, European at first, but, but apparently you were from New York. Um, what was, what was like the decisions you've sort of maybe you're happy you made in '82 versus the decisions you said you know I should have done it this way instead. A lot of bands tell me over the years, you know, Jimmy, back in '82 we should have signed with this guy instead of that guy, or we should have pushed the label harder or not. I mean, what what, what were your sort of your maybe there weren't any regrets? I don't know. 
I don't know that there are uh, regrets per se, because I am very content with where I am now. I'm pleased, happy. I'm still going. We're still doing it. I'm still speaking to you. We're, 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 you know, we're still going forward. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, of course, hindsight is 2020. At that time, when we were doing Bird and Seal 1 and Guardians of the Flame, a gentleman named Johnny Z. Of course, was Johnny Zazula. Yeah. yeah, he wanted to work with us. But we were hearing these stories about um, Metallica living in a van and eating 7-Eleven hot dogs. And we were actually making money from the record. So we're like, why would we want to do this? You know, but maybe we should have done that. And, uh, you know, perhaps we would have uh, been as big as Led Zeppelin. Who, who knows? I don't know. Or so, I knew Johnny Z pretty well. I mean, <laughs> before he died, I knew him pretty well. And we were friends. But, you know, he, he said, look, guy, look, guys, sign with me. <laughs> Is that what he said? He was, was trying something to... Something like that. Him. It was like, yeah, Raven. Uh, I think Manowar was kind of working Anthrax, with Anthrax, right? Anthrax, yeah. Yeah, and he wanted to work with us. And uh, we were definitely interested. We liked him. I used to go to Jersey. I used to go to that record store, Rock and Roll Heaven, and he had this other thing at a roller skating rink, and Judge Drummer Joey and I would go there and hang out, and uh, it was always a cool scene. But um, for whatever reason, we didn't. And uh, we went our own way and, and, and that was it. It was also, you know, we were very, very difficult to handle back then because we were really young, wild, and, and completely crazed. Dionysus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It was that, you know, on, on steroids, yeah. <laughs> All right. So some good buzz from the first album right and then you're going okay now we got to come out with the second album right yeah um you're you're how long did it take you to write the second album well we were sort of writing that right after we did the first one so it was uh i couldn't even say we were just really much non-stop at that point always doing stuff and i was even uh oh, this is there's lots of songs that didn't even appear on either of those records that i was writing you know so um, I, I, I don't know exactly, but we, we basically went into the studio for like another, maybe we had two weeks this time instead of one week and, uh, did what became the second album. It was all very, very quick. But, but David, I'm assuming before you went in the studio, you had some ideas, some blueprints. Oh, yeah, we rehearsed. Sure. We rehearsed and we had, uh, we had the song Guardians of the Flame. That's something I put together with Jack. Uh, we had the Redeemer. That's another one we put together, he and I. Um, we had, um, he had Life of Crime, Burn the Sun from, from the four track demos. So we just tweaked them and, you know, from playing them live and whatnot, they, they took different shape. Uh, Metal City came about. Um, I had a cry in the night and uh, um, Don't Say Goodbye. It was written those, brought those to the band. They liked them and we, we did those. Uh, the other thing I found when doing this uh, transfer of the second record was this crazy thing called Chaos Caprice. It was this wild piano solo I had done. It's yeah. a minute, three seconds long. I said, oh, I forgot about that. Then I was like, oh, yeah, now I remember, you know, why we did that one and what, where it went down. So said, that's going to go where we're supposed to go when we did the album in front of Crying the Night. So that's where it, that's where it goes. Did you, uh, did you redo any vocals or did you have any alternate vocal takes? There were some uh, alternate vocal things here and there on the second album, a little bit on the first album, not really very much because it wasn't really the tracks left over for it. But on the second album, there were a couple of couple of things that I was able to say, hmm, that actually might be better. Let's go with that. Because really, like when we mixed that album, God is I'm talking about it, it was like, all right, if there was a double, just you, you, you didn't even know because you didn't have a chance to really listen back, which was the better vocal. You just put one up and the other one sat behind it. So now you could actually listen. I had the time go, well, this one is actually better than that one. Let's let's feature that one rather than that one. So some of that went on and some of that went on with uh, a little bit of everything, you know, so. I think on Don't Say Goodbye, you added a little keyboard there on that song. I think the orchestration sort of keyboards in the background, which makes it pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's a bit more bombastic, and also it, uh, none of the songs that on the on that record that faded out fade out on on this on the this remix version. Everything goes right to the end. Yeah, because yeah. there's stuff there, and that was interesting stuff there. Sort of, well, if, if I can mix it and make it interesting all the way to the end, I'm staying with it to the end. No fading out. We're going. We're going for it. All, Plus, all there, there was a, I think it's burn the sun. There's a count in right. You you do a count in that you actually left. When you oh yeah, that's. Uh, the chatter between the control room 
and us, yeah, yeah, going for take that sort of stuff. Yeah, there's a bit of that left in. Metal City's got some of that. Yeah. What what song on the second album did you find a challenge to remix? You just going, oh my god, I got to get this right. It took the longest amount of time. I think probably the longest was um, Metal City, only because I was not happy with the um, the sound of some of the guitars. Just trying to like find that sweet spot where they 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 jump and do their thing and, and they're not you know, ripping your, your ear off, but they're, they're still chunky and powerful. That was tricky. But uh, all, the, all the songs had their little issues because like it was done, like I said, very, very quickly. So some of what was printed was a bit weird. Like we were doing um, multiple mics on, on, on the uh, guitar cabinets, distance, near that kind of thing. And sometimes they were blended and they weren't blended necessarily always that well. So it was a, it was a challenge to kind of work work that out and sometimes the ones that the i could see from the track sheet the tr things that were printed got erased for something else so there was some stuff that was not there so it was like okay how do we work this let's let's be creative let's think all right is i know there's a solution and and there always was a solution did the second album in, back in the day i'm sure it's outsold the first album correct yeah yeah it did yeah. You had better distribution. You had yeah. better on the shelves. I mean, what was the buzz like for the second album? You're, you're, you know, now you're two albums in. You're, you know, I, I think was it in '83 or '84 it was released. I think it was '80. '83 came out. '83, yeah. right? You, I, I think you were on tour with Anthrax, and did, did you tour with Anthrax and Raven, or was we, that we did some some one-off type type things with with them? Yeah. What was it like back? I mean, we went with Motorhead. You went with different yep. bands out on tour, right? We played with Mountain. We played with Crocus, Man of War. Yeah, you know, we did lot, lots of stuff. Yeah, the, the doors started opening more when we did the second album, more gigs, and um, um, just more and more fan mail started coming in. I have this. I had this massive box which got, you know, uh, filled up and then you need another box and that kind of thing. So it was, it was growing and growing right after we did, uh, Guardians of the Flame, I, probably within a matter of weeks or uh, up two months, maybe we went in and did the, those EPs, Wait for the Night and Climb the Night. So we were, we were definitely like, you know, just trying to stay in the studio and keep pumping out more tracks and that's why those are also included on guardians of the flame yes, and yes, those which is pretty cool. cool yes 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 that so we should talk about the bonus tracks i'm the one go down fighting wait, wait for the for night me. and uh and then we'll get into the covers but what did you do differently on those tracks like you just basically what did you do differently on those those were even rawer than what went on 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 the guardians uh, record and we used a different engineer for most of that, who was guy who was more in training mm -hmm. than the other guy we used on Guardians. So things were a bit more rough and ready all around. Uh, but it was a good experience. It was a lot of fun. And we did everything super, super quickly like once again. Uh, and um, I don't know. It just seemed to, seemed to work. I remember just uh, crazy, crazy nights in the studio, crazy days in the studio, and uh, people going you know, ballistic, everybody in the band going ballistic. Uh, well, I mean, the excitement level must have been high, right? You're coming out with your second album. There's a lot of buzz. Yep. Um, what were the most memorable tours that you had? I mean, I know you mentioned them, but were, were like Crocus, for example, was that, how did that come along? Uh, Crocus was, was great to, to work with. Mountain, Leslie West was wonderful because I, I, I love Mountain. I had those records, so it was, it was, a, it was a, a treat to play, play with, with those guys. Uh, the Manuel guys were, were absolutely great, yeah. Um, and then we ended up going over to Europe with them when we did Noble Savage, which wasn't far away from uh, you know, when we did Guardians. You know, things things were working pretty swiftly all around. Yeah, I can't um, I, I can't say enough good things. It was it was a wonderful, you know, amazing, exciting time time to be alive. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was wonderful. It Those clubs. Was great on the island. The club scene on Long Island, New York, was oh, like tremendous. Yeah. You know, five hundred thousand people out on a Monday night, Tuesday night, every night. I spent probably eight to ten years out every single night. And I do mean every single night. I never was home. 
Yeah. And we do two, three, four clubs a night going to, if I, if we weren't doing a gig, we'd be out, you know, in, in, in watching another band. You know, they talk about the Sunset Strip, but it was happening everywhere. It wasn't only the Sunset Strip where everybody yeah. was out going to clubs all the time. It was East Coast as well, right? Sure. And not only there, but in Europe and around the world. It was just, uh, you know, it was just a, a great time to for metal, I guess, right? This it definitely metal. was, and you didn't have all these distractions of uh, people gaming and internet and all that other stuff. You know, uh, people have more, more choices of things they could do at that time. There wasn't that back then you know you if you wanted to if you wanted to meet uh girls or you know, girls wanted to be guys or whatever you had to go out you know that was the, that was the situation you went out to the clubs i remember in new york because i used to go to new york because my, my family's there but at the radio there was a metal channel on the radio at one point yeah. you know there was and did virgin steel ever get to that radio level back in the day we got to like there was a station on the island um called WBAB, which is still going. It's a, it's a big station. They would play us like late night and their metal hours and things of that nature. But all the college radio played Bird and Steel. Yeah, so it was good. I'd go do interviews there, uh, all the college radio stations and whatnot, make the rounds. So it was good. What was, like, Bird and Steel had this long career, hardcore following, you know, you've, you've definitely done great music. But what was the next level? Where do you say that, you know, man, I wish we would have got to the, you know, Choir Riot hit that next level. Maybe it was a one-timer, more or less, but, uh, you know, that Iron Maiden level, that next big level, what what was your sort of your thinking back then? How can we get there? Did you ever think? We didn't think. Well, I didn't think along those lines. I just thought, let's make a great album. Let's do a great show. Let's see what, what goes on. Um, I, I thought like those, some of those goals were, um, they were within reach, but they weren't in reach. It depends on, on, what, on what you wanted to do and how much you were willing to sacrifice your own soul with some of that stuff. Some of these guys that we mentioned, you mentioned, got lucky and didn't have to necessarily do that. But there was a lot of, yeah, you know, uh, what's that man war song? Cut off your hair and buy small gear. All men play on 10. You know, like, you know, all men play on 10. Yeah. 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 We didn't want to do, we, we were, you know, like they didn't want to do that. We didn't want to do that. But there was, there was, you know, people coaching us to do this, that, and the other thing and, you know, rein it in or whatever. And we didn't really want to do that. I know I didn't want to do that. Um, for me, it wasn't, I never thought of it as a career. It was, for me, it was going to be a way of life. I was going to try to develop a way of life that would sustain me and sustain uh, the group to us, you know, throughout our lives. And and I did that, not necessarily with the original lineup, but what came from like Noble Savage forward, me and Edward um, and so on. We did that because those guys in the band have been in the band for 20 years. Edward and I have been together forever, you know, since before Bird Steel, my first album, we were playing together, you know, so... Um, we did make a way of life. Do you have a lot of, uh, in your basement, do you have a lot of live uh, soundboard, uh, you know, tapes that you still exist from that back in the day? Sure. There's lots of stuff. Cassette things and whatnot, mini disc things. Audible, or, I guess. Audible stuff that can... Some, some not so audible, some some audible. Yeah, some audible. Yeah, there are, there are, there are things like that. Yeah. And I, you know, little by little, they might eat their way out along the way. I would like to do a massive, massive DVD type thing, historical perspective movie, you know, let's call it a movie. Documentary? Um, documentary. documentary on, on uh, Bird and Steel. And then, you know, you could feature some of those things all along the way, bits and pieces of stuff, full songs, whatever, whatever might sonically have uh, held its integrity together. Any, any plans to do that or just something, a wish list? There are not concrete plans but that is on that's definitely on my wish list and 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 everything that is my on my wish list i do make plans to do that and i've already been cataloging and organizing all that material so i think what we're going to do next is um we're obviously we're doing another new album after this whole barrage but i want to do our song remains the same kind of a thing documentary movie live concert thing about what where virgin seal is now and then as an adjunct to that, it would be this historical perspective thing. 
So tell me about have you have you started writing a new album? Yes, there's lots of songs. You don't going. stop for a second, or that's the thing. You don't stop for a second. <laughs> I, I am, no, there's I'm no not. on off. It's just on right all the time. <laughs> as far as the song is concerned, yes, yes, I'm always writing, and we've actually got probably about uh, twenty somewhat songs in various stages of completion on tape, and there are more songs that are just living on cassette because that's where they start with me. I always write on the cassette first, uh, and the stuff that's just in my brain. So yeah, all these things will be uh, explored fully before I choose what will be on the next record. The next record probably, in all honesty, is probably a double situation already, like either an act one, act two, probably if we don't want to release it all together, it would be something like that, like the marriage was or how the house was, that kind of a thing. So you mean yeah. like part one will be released first and then yeah. later on, it'll, not, not a double album, right? Probably part one, part two is I think, the way that the, the, the uh, what I understand from my conversations with the label, it's they're more about one disc at a time right now. The way it's the the market is, is working, but you never know, it might change in a year or so. And what about you? I, I, if it's a part one, part two, it must be some sort of concept, right? That you're thinking about. I am thinking, yeah, that there is a conceptual idea, but it's not necessarily at the moment. All the lyrics aren't written, completely yeah. written yet, but at the moment. It's more uh, conceptual in the way that Age of Consent was or Noble Savage was. Well, there's an overarching theme, but it's not necessarily a, a, um, every song is, is a step in the next uh, narrative. What do you do? Like you just say, you know what, I'm going to start talking about this subject and I'll start exploring that subject and I'll go deep dive into this. How do you do it? Or just it naturally comes about, you just think of ideas or... Ooh. How do you get that concept? Like after, and, and you know, it's not like, it's been a lot of years here too, right? So, it, you know, you start running out of directions, right? You've covered so much ground. I, I guess the, the best way to describe it is that I look around and see how am I living? What's my life like? What am I doing? What do I think? What am I re reflecting on? How I'm living, who I'm living with, who, who is in my circle? Who's part of my tribe? Who isn't that kind of a thing? What are they doing? What are we doing? Where are we going in this in this uh, grand scheme of life uh, on this journey? And that's my approach. And then I I have a lot of um, I have a lot of knowledge from from myth. And and so if I want to not necessarily um, paint a very clear, detailed picture of what my life might be like, I can shroud it in in the mystery of myth. So it, it's it's got a multi-purpose meaning so it's not like okay this is what happened to me yesterday people can read their own life into it which i like you know yeah. there's a message in effort find your own message and it. it doesn't have to be what mine is yeah. well the last album was pretty deep and in, into the sort of exploration i mean that's a lot of I, I wouldn't say a lot of reading but i'd say a lot of uh, discovery and a lot of uh, it's intertwined Dionysus and resurrection the themes and but we went through all that last time. It's that's a lot. It's deep, right? I mean, you got to really know your stuff to do that. All right, going back to the album, the uh, additional bonus tracks. You're doing some cover songs: Heaven's Door, Knock on Heaven's Door, Desert Plains, Judas Priest cover, Dirty Blonde Angel. I don't remember who does that. I can't remember. That's a new song that I actually wrote. Well, it's I wrote it during Age of Consent, but okay. we. Put it away. I never did anything with it. We didn't record it then. We didn't record it until now to do it for this this record. It was one of those things. I was like, "What are we going to do?" You know, for bonus stuff. I was just thinking, and I was playing that one night. I was in the phone with that, or I played it on the piano with the phone. I was like, "Oh yeah, I remember that's a good one." So uh, let's do that. So we did that one. That was that's how that came about. So uh, that's not even a re-record. That's a brand new song. That's a new song. Yeah, yeah, and it's written in the spirit of like like something for Age of Consent, or might have even like just like a little before Age of Consent when I when I wrote that. So I thought that might fit in with the vibe of of Guardians. Let's let's see how that works. Desert Plains. That's an alternate version, different mix of what we did on Age of Consent, uh, the Judas Priest cover. And it's funny. I you know I tell people this now and again, and they're like, "What?" Uh, I thought that. Going out to the clubs for a period of, you know, every night for eight to 10 years, mm -hmm. I saw this band, Swiftcake, who I became friendly with. 
and they played those plays. I thought they did it. I, I didn't know it was a Jewish priest song. I thought Swift people wrote it. So I said, this is a great song. <laughs> I discovered that Jewish priest did it. And uh, our approach when we did it was like, well, let's let's change it. Let's make it um, different. So it's got the keyboards and whatnot. So it's got a different feel. And it's got some of that um, darkness and some of that energy that uh, Guardians has. So I thought that might work on, on that record. And, it, and it, I think it does. Uh, the other track, the Heaven's Door Suite is a rewritten, re, reconvened, restructured idea of knocking on Heaven's Door. Other things. So that, and just to clarify, like there's remix, which is you're taking old music and you're just remixing it, right? There's re-recording, basically today your band and you're re-recording yeah. a song, and then there's touch-ups, I guess, on alternate takes. So wh where does this fit? Where does Heaven's uh, Door? Uh, that's new. Those are new recordings. Those are new. So we yeah. got we got Dirty Blonde Angel and Knocking on Heaven's Door as two new songs that and even Desert Plains, is that considered like a new version of that song? It's mostly the old uh original performance, but there were other that there were other vocal takes on there. It was like, wow, I never listened to this. This is actually better than what we actually used last time. So let's use this here, that kind of a thing. Yeah, so there's a little bit of that. There's one or two uh guitar things that were a little a little different the solos there was a couple of solos that edward had done um and then this other stuff that i added on um, uh, yeah and then and then makes the whole track again All right so so actually there's a lot that's a lot for people you know you've really included a lot of stuff is the original album going to be on this as well or is it strictly the remix the anniversary remix all the remix stuff yeah there wasn't room on on uh, unless you they wanted to do a second cd yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and that's you, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes bands they they like. I think it was Dio. He had he left the original mix, and then he put the remix on the same. But that was like five CDs or something, right? Yeah, it would have been some something something larger than. Yeah, I did that with uh, Visions of Eden. I remixed the full record, and then I gave a remastered version. So there were two discs on that on that uh, release. All right, is there anything that you want to add to oh I, I should ask you what about touring plans okay COVID's all gone now and people are back on i think last time we talked to you is still things were sort of not quite there yet but COVID's gone what, what do you have in terms of touring plans we are doing uh the uh, true high festival in uh germany yeah. on august 24th the day after these records are released okay. um we've been offered we had been offered a bunch of dates in Italy, some festival things, but um, the new government that just came into Italy would not give the promoter these uh, permits they needed for these other outdoor open air things. So that's going to be postponed to like like uh, um, autumn or winter. So we'll be going there then to do some of that stuff. Uh, and we just somebody approached me about doing like like sixteen dates possibly with Ross the Boss. Um, oh, cool. All so right. speaking of man of war that could be a nice reunion or something like that so yeah i'm 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 up for it uh let's see how it develops is that with like i know ross too but is that would be that would that be considered like u.s dates is that what he's looking at these these were uh i was approached from somebody in in uh, on our german office so these would be okay. i believe it was going to be germany austria switzerland i think france they said uh denmark it was like five or five countries you'll be like 12 to 16 dates i'm not exactly sure if it's gonna manifest but we'll see we'll see i'm keeping you know my... i'd like to see some canadian uh, u.s dates uh, with ross that'd be a perfect yeah. mix that'll be nice that'll be nice sure Love so it. let's just reach out to the promoters right here and now and say sure. give him a shout all right <laughs> is there anything else you want to talk about in regards to these albums tell people about them ah uh, it was uh, i can tell you it was a uh, it was a magical experience to to go and try to resurrect these in this way, and um, it brought back, as we discussed earlier, so so many memories, mostly good, uh, of people, places, and things that uh, I've known and experience I've I've had, and uh, I think um, I think it's 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 a very honest approach to what was originally there. I just said let's let's bring these back to a feeling as if we had just recorded them today and mixed them today with that same kind of vibe, that same kind of energy, only just, you know, um, 
more understandable for the for the ear. And I think I think that mission uh, has been accomplished. All right. You know what? On that note, thank you so much, David, for being on the show again. You know, I think we covered everything. I think we were back. Uh, people, all they need to know is on this show, and that's it. No one else. That's it. Show. That's all it, right, buddy. Thank <laughs> you so much for your time. Have yourself a wonderful a night. And you know what? I'm in Canada, so I hope one day Virgin Steel will be around somewhere where I am at. Just to, uh, I hope guys. so as well. Yeah, I'd love to meet you in the uh, face-to-face mode. Yeah. Have a great, yeah. Have a great <laughs> night, okay?